<laughs> and we're live. Thank you guys so much for waiting and bearing with us. Let me turn down my volume a little bit. It looks like I'm peaking. Georgie Dinkov, how are you, sir? Hello. Thanks for having me again. I'm, I'm fine, you know, a little tired, but, uh, but you know, glad to be here. So where should we start? Should we catch up on Corona stuff? It feels like we've been, we haven't uh, been like uh, done a live stream for a little while because of those uh, Ray Pete interviews. How, how do you feel about them? I'm very, I'm overjoyed to have him on. Um, and again, I'm, uh, I, I love him. Um, I got some emails about the, about the second one. Uh, people said it was, it was too grim. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I guess we did discuss some stuff that's not exactly pleasant to hear, but you know, ultimately, you know, you, you, you kind of have to base things on reality, even if it's unpleasant. Um, what do they say? Truth, like even a single truth is better than a, a pack of beautiful lies or something like that. Single ugly truth. Well, well um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I thought, I thought he gave a lot of good information, um, spe especially when it comes to viruses, because, uh, I've talked to many people, people who follow the, the Peterianism movement for many of them, the idea that the virus could actually be something beneficial and that, you know, it's a mechanism of horizontal gene transfer that was completely news to them. So I thought thought that's that's pretty important for people to know well i uh we like goofed up the time the first day and i called him because we were like trading emails back and forth and i was like ray i'm semi hysterical about this whole thing and he's like that's okay but we we have to get organized <laughs> and so <laughs> so i'm right there with you and you know i'd rather i'd rather go out on a limb and say and uh i don't know express how uh, how reality is playing out rather than sugarcoating it, you know? So yeah. I think it's a bad, really bad situation, you know? So I don't know how to, how to sugarcoat Did you it. see the news about all of the uh, field hospitals uh, that, that they were built with all this money staying completely empty? Mm -hmm. um, and now the governors, the governors are scrambling to come up with explanation, excuse me, saying, oh, yes, they're empty, but that's actually good news. <laughs> it means... We handled it really well. <laughs> and, actually, you know, as much as mainstream media tries to play into this whole charade, they're like, yeah, but what are we going to do with all these empty hospitals now? And like, so didn't we overdo it a little bit? And like, yeah, yeah, we did. But we, you want to overdo it, not underdo it. We don't want to be collapsing the healthcare system, right? And then I don't know if you see the other article starting to pop up is this. Basically, the hospitals are now empty. Like uh, all the strokes, heart attacks. Um, like cancer, every all all the deaths that have, that used to be recorded or used to be really high, now they're like fifty to seventy percent down. And then and then of course the which is probably partially true is like oh people are just dying at home, they're not going to the hospitals. And I and I remember that article that said that when doctors went on strike or like basically went to these conferences, the mortality rate dropped by like double digit percent. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know what? This may actually be the event that can. You know, if it turns out that it's not just people dying at home, which I'm sure there are, it is there is there is a percentage of that. But if it's just people are suddenly saying, you know what, my neighbor is my neighbor is really sick, but ever since he stopped going to the doctor, this guy is now walking his dog, playing baseball with his grandkids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know what? I'm just not gonna go to the doctor anymore. <laughs> I mean, like, you know what? What's the point? What's the point? Look, you know, he's better. He he feels better now. So maybe that that is. If not the thing, one of the things that will get people to start thinking of what exactly is medicine providing us with, aside from like emptying our pockets, right? So all these field hospitals built, the federal government paid for it most of these, right? They're all empty. I mean, without a doubt. Government saying like, oh, that's a that, this is great news. You know, we we did really well. And at the same time, they're saying we completely fumbled the response to the COVID, right? So which one is it, people? Either the the original projection that all of these sick people will overwhelm the healthcare system, either those projections were completely wrong, right? Um, or, or something else is going on, or like the virus is not as deadly as you guys used to say, or the doctors are actually killing more people because now that people are not going, not going to the hospital, mortality rate is dropping, or maybe all of these combined, you know? Um, so I, I think if nothing else, it will add yet another layer of woke people, as they as they like to call them, to who at the very least will start questioning, like, w what are we doing and what are we paying for? Um, are, are we getting anything out of this? I mean, forget about forget about like for a lot of these things, they'll say, oh, it's it's hard to really be beneficial because we don't know what the cause of specific disease is. But now they're saying, okay, so you're telling me you can't cure my RA, my rheumatoid arthritis, because it's an autoimmune condition. You don't know the cause. But now I stop going to the doctor 
and I'm actually feeling better, right? I'm not, maybe I'm not cured, but I'm feeling better. Yet when I was going and seeing you guys and you're giving me Humira, I was feeling like crap. Yes, I didn't have symptoms, but I was feeling worse. So maybe you are the people making me worse, right? And maybe my condition that you've named and numbered and the insurance company has 20 codes for it, maybe it's really not as severe as you're trying to make it out to be, or you know, maybe, maybe it's not as incurable as you're trying to make it out to be. So let's see what happens. I mean, if, if sufficient number of people you know, gets to the point of of getting of feeling better and actually objectively getting better without a doctor about without a medical intervention. I think that that may actually do more for for social freedom than than you know all of the YouTube videos of woke people combined. Well, uh, you're probably more clued into the news than I am. Like I, I barely ever hear anything, but something that uh, like there was like a viral video of somebody uh, who worked in like the sports world, and he was like. For the last uh, X amount of months, we've been told, like, flatten the curve, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. But now we're being told we need to find a cure. And he's like, what the, what the hell? Like, w since when can we find cures to things? Like, we can't find cures to the common cold or we can't find cures to cancer. Or we can't find cures to anything. So now we're all just going to wait in our homes forever to, to wait until we find the cure. And so it's just like obvious media manipulation of, of the agenda. And then... And then I, I'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But there is lots of talk of a second wave. And so people have ter termed this dark winter. And so it, it will be interesting if something else happens to, like, really scare the hell out of people. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't think it will be called COVID, though, unless they come up with a separate strain. Because if we um, – have you seen the, the interviews that Luc Montagnier has been giving, uh, like, in the last two no, months? No, no. So he's the, the discover co-discoverer of HIV, no Nobel Prize winner, right? And just like Warburg, Warburg back in the day when he started talking about cancer being metabolic disease, it's like it's like he died scientifically. Like <laughs> he became the pariah of the scientific world. Nobody wanted to invite him. Nobody wanted to sponsor his work. Nobody wanted to listen to him anymore. Same thing with St. Georgie, right? Um, and, and basically they, they call it the the Nobel curse. So uh, like the, the mainstream media and the public thinks that – you know, I guess after a person gets a Nobel Prize, they're past their prime. Mm -hmm. So then they start to dabble into these really insane, <laughs> like like crazy topics, right? That have not think that are completely berserk, right? <laughs> but if you look at what these people do, actually, you'll see that. I mean, you know, okay, maybe the Nobel to a large degree is a political uh, award, right? But like, if you look at the Nobel Prize winners, especially Warburg, Saint George, and now Montagnier, they actually did a lot more after the, they won the Nobel Prize. Montagnier said, used to say, "Oh, HIV is, is dangerous." Very, uh, he may be, he may be, may have been part of the establishment, and you know, probably received a lot of money. But at some point, he said, "You know what? I'm changing my mind completely. HIV is not dangerous for most people. If you keep the gut clean, and you can actually treat most cases of HIV with antibiotics." The moment he said that, they basically declared that he's that that he is disturbed, mentally disturbed, and I think they actually fired him from his position at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Mm -hmm. Um, and now he's he's basically in an exile in Africa, where he's advising a lot of the presidents of these country, of African countries how to deal with the with the HIV AIDS epidemic. And I don't, I mean you you I guess you're not that younger than me, but like um, in the in the mid 90s, there were these scary news saying like oh my God Africa is screwed. Like th there are countries where it's like 20 percent of the population has HIV and AIDS. They're gonna die out completely before like like in the next 10 20 years. Of course, none of that happened, right? I mean, some people died, but because of wars and famine and whatnot. But somehow the AIDS epidemic did not play out the way people have been saying it would. And Montagnier says, look, um, actually, like the biggest problem in Africa is sanitation. And if you if you get that under control, which is which, of course, is like is like reading off of Jamie Cunliffe's, you know, um, like uh, morphostasis theory of immunity, right? He's like, look, get sanitation under control. For people that are that have really bad digestive problems, get them on a course of antibiotics, and in in 99% of the cases, HIV is not going to be a problem. That's the that's what the discoverer of HIV is saying. And now mainstream media wants us to turn around and say, "Oh no, the guy's completely berserk." Why? You said listen to the experts, right? <laughs> he's the guy who invented it, and he's saying the same thing now about autism. He's saying, um, "I don't know exactly what autism is." He hasn't. He's still a little bit careful. Um, about going completely against like the tide, uh, the mainstream, right? So he 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 doesn't say certain, but he's like whatever whatever autism is, it 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 starts in the gut, and he's saying 
a, cor- a mild course of antibiotics produces dramatic improvements in autistic children. So I'm like, dude, I mean, and, and actually I emailed him uh, back in 2011. I asked him about Ray P. He, he claimed he didn't know about it. <laughs> Uh, but now he sounds to, starts to sound more and more <laughs> like Ray. So um, who knows? Maybe Ray's ideas will become popular through somebody else. Um, either way, I, th- I mean, I'm actually kind of encouraged. Well, when we have him on again, I want to bring this up to him. But did you catch that in the, the email uh, depository? Somebody asked him if there was a way, and we've talked about this on the show, if, if there was a way to mitigate the effects of a specifically like a aluminum adjuvant a vaccine. Yeah, and he said you're never the same even after a single that, vaccine. So, yeah. so that's crazy, you know. Because one, if you followed Ray long enough, you know that I can't think of anything that he's ever said similar to that, you know. And and again, I like I, somebody asked me what like that that it was really depressing that he said that, and I interpreted it as, it as like changing the trajectory of a person's life. You know, that doesn't mean you can't have a yeah. somewhat like a good fulfilling life. You'll just probably never reach the peaks uh, that you could have, you know? And so, right. yeah. I mean, it goes back to his um, to his other comment about diet. Somebody said like, hey, Ray, I mean, all these things you're advocating, I mean, they're, they're basically impossible with the current, uh, you know, like nutritional supply. So do you believe a perfect diet is possible? And he said, if by perfect mean making educated choices is what's available, yes. Otherwise, no, yeah. right? So so it's, it's just, it's just you're constrained by the realities, you know? If you get, if you get injected by 20 vaccines and all of them contain al- aluminum and God knows what else, right? HCG, which is like the the, the sterilizing agent in the Kenyan vaccines. Um, uh, Tamer- I think they removed Timerosal, but they, th- believe me, they've replaced it with other things now. <laughs> and it, uh, I'm sure you've seen Dr. Mikovic's two movies that just came oh, out. Uh, uh, pandemic or whatever. Yeah, Pandemic, exactly. There's Pandemic and there, there, there are two others that, that just came out. Uh, they may have been older, but for some reason, they became well, not some reason. She became popular, so now her other movies are becoming popular. She's saying that every single flu vaccine, actually every single vaccine that she's tested, uh, she said she claims that she was contaminated with retroviruses. Oh. Um, so, so I mean, like clearly, what you're getting injected with is not just the antigen and an adjuvant to trigger an immune response. There's more in there, and and of course, you know, like uh, once you start asking questions, records. People suicide, like <laughs> sign of mental illness before and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you know if you get injected with something like, because once you once it gets into your bloodstream, many of your defenses that are normally present, such as gastric acid, the pancreatic enzymes, right, uh, the like the, the the gut barrier, all of these things that will filter out many of them to a great degree when uh, to filter out toxins when you ingest them, right? Then it's the liver, right? So you get these multiple layers of, of defense. Once you put something in your bloodstream, um, you know, basically every cell in your body is exposed. And for people, I think I think Ray did actually um, expand on this a couple of years ago. It wasn't in regards to the COVID because there wasn't no vaccine. You know, there was no COVID back then. But um, somebody asked him, like, um, uh, what are the layers of dangers of something like that? What are the layers of dangers of the vaccines and who is, who, which people are the most susceptible? And he basically said, if you have a compromised blood brain barrier or a gut barrier, it's much more dangerous uh, for, for those people. And then for the others, it may, it may trigger stress, but he said like, and that was like both good. It was like the sinister thing was like, uh, you will probably be okay. And so will be your children, but like three, four generations down the road, Bad things may start happening, and, and they will not know what caused it, and it will be the vaccine. Uh, like it, he was more concerned about a transgenerational effects, specifically things that are three to four generations later. He wasn't so concerned about uh, you know the immediate impact to the to the organism and and and, and like in the in the offspring. So um, unfortunately, you know, we 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 won't know until you know um, you know 100, 200, 200 years later. So we'll see what happens, but. Uh, um, you know, I'm seeing there's a there are a couple of websites that track basically the uh, um, they do it the other way. Basically, these are vaccination pro vaccination websites, and they track uh, clusters of people. Basically, the increase in the amount, the increase in the community of anti vaxxers These websites, you'll see that that basically um, there's an exponential increase of people for going vaccines completely. Um, so, so whatever is happening out there, basically a lot of people are saying, you know what, 
I'm just going to, you know, even if it's just uh, taking the position of diagnostic, right? I mean, I talked to a doctor friend of mine and I said, because he's so sure, used to be very sure in everything he was saying. Now he's not so sure about cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You know why? Not because something changed, but FDA said dietary cholesterol is no longer dangerous. And I said, listen, you go to Wall Street and talk to, a, to an investment bank or, or a trader, they'll tell you, they actually don't particularly care who has, who knows the truth. They they say nobody knows the complete truth. Mm -hmm. So they make bets and they hedge those bets. Mm -hmm. What really astounds me in your profession is that you people are so sure of yourself, yet you know apparently the big money says you should hedge <laughs> on, on every bet if possible, right? It's just nobody has the complete truth. And that is... It's, it's it's an approach that seems to be pervasive in life in just about every discipline except medicine. And he's like, well, Georgie, if you what you say is correct, we're all screwed. So uh, <laughs> I might as well have my peace of mind and not sit there depressed and, and have my spouse leave me because all I do is discuss how FDA is out there to kill us. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? You, you do have a point. <laughs> <laughs> well, but at the same time, we, we can't keep our, our eyes closed. We need to move forward. And, and we can move on but a, after this. But like, the one thing that I was shocked to like uh, investigating not only the Rockefeller Foundation, but the WHO. And, and then I, 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 apparently the WHO's whole purpose, like the World Health Organization, that sounds like it'd be uh, mainly about like uh, improving the environment. But a lot of, I, I guess, the, the deep roots of the WHO is about population control. And like a person could go yeah. go look that up. I'm not I'm not lying, but they they see that as the greatest public health threat is an increased population. And so I posted something on my Twitter about Paul Ehrlich, and he's the population uh, bomb guy. And yeah. there was like a short video about how he has been like extraordinarily wrong on all his claims, like saying that the world would be overpopulated in 1980, and that they're like just a bunch of really crazy claims. And so again, I, uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell this to anybody watching this, but like, I think this thing is intertwined with that, those old beliefs. And then, and, and I'm sure we'll flush this out more with Ray. And th then, uh, did I mention it? The Mexico, Nicaragua, Kenya, and Philippines, all those places were provided HCG vaccines. Um, yeah. So th that Kenya. is- Kenya, I read an article about Kenya. And then people need to read the, have you ever read the Kissinger Report? And it's all about population reduction. And then also referring to those places specifically as LDCs, lower, deve um, lower developed countries, I think. And they, and Kissinger in this 1970 uh, document is especially concerned with the LDCs and their rate of, of population growth. And so again, it, all of this fits together very nicely, but um, I think because people uh, have one, been lied to their entire lives, and then two, are being poisoned at the same time, have difficulty making a lot of the connections. All I have to say about Kissinger is keep in mind, this guy is a war criminal, wanted war criminal in several several Southeast Asian countries. If he ever sets a foot there, he will probably be taken out if it wasn't for the heavy security. I mean, he's already way too old. I think he's in his mid nineties at this point. So I don't think he'll be visiting Vietnam or, or, or like or Cambodia or, uh, or Thailand anytime soon. Uh, but he is wanted in some of those countries as a war criminal. So, um, you know, um, keep in mind, no, no U.S. president, even though some of them actually started the wars there, um, none of them are considered war criminals. I mean, they're maybe disliked, but Kissinger, because of his direct involvement in what the CIA did there and some of the some of the drug smuggling that the CIA continues to do, at least that the rumor is, um, uh, you know, Kissinger is will be tried as a war criminal if, if they can ever get their hands on him. But uh, they won't. So <laughs> so it's a moot point. Anyway, so anything that this guy says, I'll take with a heavy grain of salt, especially when he claims to be doing it for the benefit of humanity. Uh, few people still alive today are, are as evil and as and, and humanistic as, as, as Kissinger, at least at least in my opinion. Agreed. OK, we'll stop the depressing chat about reality <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh so we didn't talk about this i hope this is okay georgie but l let's restart the giveaway you know is that okay 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 yeah that's fine and, and uh, the only caveat here guys is that we're it's going to be u.s only and i sincerely apologize to our international listeners i know there's a lot of them but it's just it's it's too cumbersome and expensive to ship the 
supplements all over the world. Uh, and so for this to, to maintain, uh, uh, for us to be able to do this regularly, we have to segregate it to the, the U.S. audience. So I apologize. But again, Georgie is being so nice to graciously provide these toko bits at um, just the gracious, being so gracious. So we appreciate it. So all you need to do to enter is to like this episode, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. And thank you. That's and cool. one addition from me: yeah. if these, if somebody wins, if somebody's like let's say international and wins, and and let's say um, we can send it if they plan on making an order, right? Okay. So it's like it's not a problem. I mean, to add it if they're already planning on making an order. The problem is if we have to send it because right now with a regular mail, they're like uh, just a little digression. I mean, I think people would care to hear that USPS has decided without notifying anybody that instead of returning packages that are delayed for whatever reason due to the virus, now they're going to move them from air routes to both routes. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at like two to three month delays and potentially many packages being lost. That's really, it's not really the cost to me. It's the fact that people will be waiting for their stuff for months and it, there is a good chance that, that they, they may never get it. To me, that's actually more important than that will be, oh, I want this bottle. I really wanted it. And I'm not getting it, right? So it's like, so if you want, if you want, um, I mean, maybe if it's up to you. Um, if if they want to pay for the international shipping and take the risk on, on, on themselves, that's fine by me. I, I'm still okay with giving away a bottle. But, you know, at this point, I don't trust the mail services to, to make the giveaway, to basically claim that somebody that lives abroad will be getting their bottle when in reality there's, there's no guarantee. While for the U.S., there is more or less a guarantee. We can send it with a type of mail that, that, that we know it will arrive. So James says, what if they just offer to pay the mail costs? And so that would be fine, right? And That's perfectly yeah. fine. Keep in mind, keep in mind, because I don't want you to waste your money. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are two options right now. One of them is the regular mail, which is, is now being routed through both routes, which is mm -hmm. ridiculous to me, right? Mm -hmm. And we now offer DHL. Now, DHL is not that expensive. If you're okay with paying for DHL, it will get to you within two days. Mm -hmm. There's full tracking, full insurance, and it's only slightly more expensive than USPS. That's why we actually added. I was surprised that DHL has dropped their costs so much. So if you're okay with DHL, my my suggestion is go with that, and then and then I'm more than happy to send you the the, the talk of it. Uh, and also, guys, we're we're gonna talk about articles, and then hopefully we'll take a call or two, and then we'll do the super chats. And yeah, okay. That is out of the way. Thank you for that. Let me just take a quick, super short, quick, uh, quick break. Follow Georgie on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash hate it. His store is idealabsdc.com. Go check that out. You can follow me on Instagram, uh, uh, the Danny Ruddy weblog. I have coaching at dannyruddy.com slash resources. You can find out information about that. You can follow me at Twitter, uh, uh, twitter.com slash Danny Ruddy. And then I've been um, posting the Telegram as well. And you can, I think it's t.me slash Danny Ruddy. Okay, we have uh, many articles. Which ones did you feel like you wanted? What, which ones were you hyped about, Jordan? My goodness. Let's see. Uh, well, I mean, have, you cover, have, we co have we covered that one that I emailed you about, the estrogen is the cause of losing hair, hair loss? Not, not to my knowledge, so that would be a good starting okay. place. Um, I, I've been getting a lot of emails about it, even though it's like only like a day old or something. Um, and it's, so far, it's one of the most read articles I've posted oh, there. Oh, wow. One of, um, so basically what... what and it really destroy. it doesn't destroy, but it's like it damages the follicle and it's behind the fibrosis that forms in advanced stages of hair loss, right? The scalp actually shows clear signs of fibrosis and it's the estrogen that's really doing it. Um, and actually they tested several different estrogens and all of them, uh, even ones that, that uh, mainstream medicine claims are inactive, such as alpha estradiol. Now the typical one is 17 beta estradiol, but alpha estradiol, which is considered inactive, uh, also cause baldness, right? Um, androgens did not, right? And then things that opposed estrogen at the receptor level, they, the, that study used the drug fulvestrin, which is, I don't recommend it. Yes, it is an estrogen receptor antagonist, but it's actually just a synthetic estrogen, which if you look at the molecule, it is estradiol with a slight modification on position seven. And basically that's what endows it with, with the ability to be slightly less estrogenic. So to me, it's a serum, right? It's not a direct estrogen antagonist. It's more similar in effects to drugs like tamoxifen and, and clomiphene and raloxifene. They're all synthetic estrogens and they're anti-estrogenic in some tissues and then pro-estrogenic in others. Fulvestrin 
is probably the least estrogenic of them all, but it still has that effect. Long story short, it's the antagonism to the estrogenic receptor in the scalp, in the follicles, that allowed the basically the uh, like the researchers to completely restore hair growth in the mice. Um, and I, I did some reading, and, and and basically progesterone, which people at this point know is the endogenous antagonist to, est- to the, uh, on the estrogen receptor, the most potent one, um, can probably fill in for fulvestrin without many, if not most, of the side effects. It doesn't have the estrogenic potential of fulvestrin. Um, and um, there are some dosages that are mentioned in the study, and they're really low. And the best thing of all, they managed to completely restore hair growth by only twice weekly application. So um, if you look at the post, I, I st- basically, for a human, it would mean to treat the condition, it would mean applying one milligram of estrogen dissolved in something like acetone. They used acetone, but I think ethanol is at least as good, if not better. Um, and then they basically, the dosage was one milligram of an estrogen receptor antagonist, let's say progesterone, per 10 square centimeters of bold area, which is really not that high of a dosage. Like if you have raised progest E, I mean, you can basically rub two drops on your scalp <laughs> if you're completely bold and you should be okay. And the best thing of all is that it's the treatment was only twice a week. And after about eight to 10 weeks, if you look at the graphs, the mice had basically the hair growth was restored to control levels, to the control group. So um, I mean, I'll I'm, I'll be trying it. Let's see if other people try it. Let's see let's see how it plays out. I was, but I think that's kind of trolls like one of it just yet another myth dies. And I know the myths die hard, but uh, if you look at the study and the explanation, it says basically whoever started this whole thing about the the androgens being the cause um, is is probably one of those people that started the cholesterol myth. You know, it's the same thing. You see cholesterol co-present with cardiovascular disease. And you already have a drug to treat high cholesterol. You say, "Oh, cholesterol is the evil guy. Let's lower it, right? And treat heart disease by doing that." Same thing here. You see dihydrotestosterone rising in the scalp of people of that losing hair, and you say, "Oh, that's the evil guy. We already have a, a castration drug for prostate cancer. Let's use it for boldness as well." So, to me, it's pretty clear that um, if nothing else, the theory behind hair loss that that the mainstream medicine is pushing is false. Um, you know, um, I don't know if DHT will actually help you regrow hair, but the fact that estrogen antagonists work and DHT is an actual, is one of the endogenous estrogen antagonists suggests to me that the rising levels in the scalp of balding people is that it's an adaptive change. It's there to offset the high levels of estrogen and the high, high, high expression of the estrogen receptor as well. So just to complete this thought, two things, everybody knows that anti aromatase drugs cause hair loss. And then two, what would you say to, uh, there's a few papers that talk about topical administration of estrogen regrowing hair. So first of all, uh, the, the aromatase inhibitors, uh, like, uh, causing hair loss. I, I don't, um, if you look at the studies, you'll see that there is not a single aromatase inhibitor that is specific for aromatase. Um, all of them actually end up also lowering progesterone, right? So, and actually the study showed that it is the, 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 exp- the level of expression of the estrogen receptor in the scalp specifically that was responsible for hair loss. When they administer estrogen systemically, it did not have the hair loss effects that it had when they actually applied it topically. So the aromatase inhibitor that you're taking, they drop your estrogen systemically to the point where you are, are, you know, it shows up on the blood test that you use of systemic estrogen. That doesn't mean much about your scalp. I mean, it's the whole dichotomy between blood levels versus tissue levels, and specifically in in stressed tissues such as a scalp losing hair, right? So if your thyroid is low, we already talked about this before, your skin will pick up the slack and start producing all of these steroids. And basically, if you look at the scalp, there are a few studies that actually looked at the hormones in the scalp. Estrogen was and prolactin were also high. For, for whatever reason, yes, DHT was also high, but somehow the, the medical industry took that, that partial finding and started running with it while completely ignoring the fact that other hormones, estrogenic hormones, were also high. So again, nobody so far has proven conclusively, causatively, that DHT causes hair loss. I mean, I know people who, who have actually massaged masterone, DHT, Proverone, and a bunch of other DHT derived drugs on their on their scalp, and some of them actually started regrowing hair. 
It didn't work in many people. It was maybe about only 20%, but none of them lost more hair. So, I mean, it's called an anecdotal. It doesn't have statistical significance. But this thing, I mean, that would be my response to people saying, everybody knows aromatase inhibitors cause hair loss. Show me a selective aromatase inhibitor that does nothing else except inhibiting aromatase, and let's see if it causes hair loss or not. To my knowledge, there is no such, there is no such aromatase inhibitor on the market. And actually, we had, we had this discussion a little bit on the forum because people are saying, oh, if estrogen is not important for the bones, how come when I take an aromatase inhibitor, I'm getting joint pains, like my bones are cracking, all these studies showing bones are thinning? Again, you have not covered the fact that it lowers pregnenolone, lowers progesterone, lowers DHEA as well. These things, because the enzymes are so, the different enzymes, both the ones that synthesize arom uh, estrogen from precursors and the other steroids that synthesize progesterone and DHA, they're very similar in structure. It is very hard to develop something that is so uniquely specific to aromatase without touching other other uh, um, uh, steroids, uh, other steroidal enzymes and pathways. It, it, ironically, progesterone may be one of the most selective it's out there. And to my knowledge, people taking progesterone who have managed to tank their estrogen um, on tests, they actually specifically use progesterone as an aromatase inhibitor. There were women that didn't care about like tanking their testosterone or whatever other reasons men are afraid of progesterone from, right? And then none of them got joint pain. None of them got cracking uh, bones. None of them got osteopenia. In fact, their bone health improved. So all of these side effects that people blame on the on the too low estrogen from aromatase inhibitors, um, to me the the evidence for that is lacking. I mean, uh, if anything, we can say that non-selective aromatase inhibitors cause issues. But to blame it completely on the lack of estrogen, uh, I don't think there's evidence for that. So and what was the other one you said? Like basically, oh, people getting treated with estrogen. I looked at those studies. Uh, most of them are about people doing transgender, uh, basically switching genders. And I, I think in the vast majority of, the, of cases, these people got a combination treatment of a progestin and estrogen. Uh, the reason this is is the vast majority of cases, if not all of them, at least the recent ones, is that the, the changing gender wasn't very popular in the 20th century, all the way up, let's say, like early 90s. And at that point, medicine had already realized that giving people only estrogen is very, very dangerous. So you'll be hard-pressed to find transgender studies that used only estrogen. If you find one and show me that this led to hair regrowth, I'll consider it. But so far, the studies that I've seen always had something else. Either the person got estrogen and testosterone, if it was like a female to male, um, or if the, or basically like the person who, uh, who got there, uh, who was converting from male to female, they actually got castrated. Keep in mind that actually drops estrogen, right? So And, and serotonin seen, and prolactin. That's right. That's right. So the studies that I've seen have not been able to isolate uh, the, the estrogen as a cause of hair regrowth, and I don't believe it is. Um, I don't know of a study that actually is well designed and, and, and has managed to isolate it to claim a cause. If you have such a study, please send it to me because I've looked at this and almost all of them are progestin and estrogen or male to female and they got castrated. So things like that. I, we've, I know I'm re uh, recovering old ground here, but I'll probably set, uh, cut this out. And so I just want to complete the thought. But th I think there's one study where they might have used some kind of topical treatment of estrogen and the guy regrew hair. And so I, I, and I'm curious on your thoughts, but since minoxidil is a pro nitric oxide drug or agonist or whatever, um, and finasteride by decreasing DHT, uh, I don't know if it's ever been measured, but probably I think DHT is like a nitric oxide inhibitor. Do you think it's plausible yeah. that putting yourself in this intense stress state where you're increasing estrogen to and nitric oxide to a supraphysiological level increases vasodilation and then that can result in some type of head hair growth? Uh, I think the the mechanism in my in my view is is related to lo local tissue injury. Um, Ray mentioned a few times that people like fell into a fireplace and burnt his scalp, and then he started regrowing hair. Mm -hmm. And another one, got, I think, got like a like a cut across his scalp with a knife mm -hmm. um, or some kind of a sharp tool he was working in the garden. And then he also regrew hair along the scar, like around the scar. Mm -hmm. um, so minoxidil. 
and uh, I think works along the same the same lines. I, I'm not sure if it's the nitric oxide because people have, have actually tried applying Viagra because they looked at minoxidil and said, oh, so maybe it's the nitric oxide that works. So they actually tried applying Viagra to the scalp. It mm-hmm. did not work. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, I mean, to me at least, the, the, the true mechanism of minoxidil is unknown. Um, the same way the true mechanism of finasteride damaging everything is not completely known. I, I, I mean, at this point, there's evidence that finasteride is actually an androgen receptor antagonist similar to flutamide. Mm-hmm. So it's been sold as 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, and it surely is, but it's also been shown to disintegrate the androgen receptor in the cell, mm-hmm. very similar to androgen and to androgen antagonist drugs. Uh, it's also known to raise prolactin. It's known to also bind to the estrogen receptor and potentially activate some tissues. And that should actually be a sign for all of us that yet another uh, reason why, uh, you know, uh, Ray's ideas strike more true because he talks about systemic effects and the the almost the, the virtual impossibility of isolating a, an effect down a specific receptor or a specific pathway. And if all these drugs work, you know, either pro-stress or anti-stress, that's how they should be viewed and not necessarily through their, you know, through the receptors. So, um, I, I, and by the way, the minoxidil, um, it's been shown that after about six months of usage, you're reaching a plateau. And if you continue using at the same frequency, after it, you actually start losing hair. So whatever minoxidil does, it's temporary, and it does, which corroborates the idea of like an initial shock reaction on the scalp and somehow triggering, like you said, blood flow or some other kind of like a, uh, like a regenerative mechanism. But it clearly, over time, minoxidil starts to inhibit its own beneficial effects which tells me that you know it's probably not a good drug. I mean, whatever it does, it's similar to you know um, you know um, menopausal women with hot flashes and and really severe PMS symptoms when they get a little estrogen initially they feel relief, but if they continue taking it they very quickly go go berserk. I think the same thing applies to the minoxidil treatment. Well, the the nitric. I just wanted to dwell on this for a second. It wasn't the like obviously hypertension is something that's been studied in relation to pattern baldness, and then minoxidil. I think was originally being used as an anti hypertensive drug, and then isn't it commonly thought of as hypertension is a deficiency of nitric oxide, and therefore they give these pro nitric yeah. oxide drugs. But of course, yep. and maybe our view, we would look at that as low thyroid and and a lack of carbon dioxide. So, I, I mean, I just want right. to grapple with the fact that, and, and maybe you talked about it and I missed it, but like finasteride does regrow hair, but we were just talking about how, how many negative effects it does. Like, I mean, it, it occasionally does that in a small percentage of people. And, and the only reason people are probably watching this or interested in the content on my channel is because these main things we've been hearing about for many years don't really work that well. So I'll, I'll, I have to find it. There was a study about finasteride showing that it does work as an estrogen receptor antagonist, but they didn't. They, they tested different cells from different tissues, and it didn't act. It was basically like a serum, right? So 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 the finasteride regrows hair, and I think it, it corroborates the study that I just posted. It does have partially anti-estrogenic effects depending on where it's applied. Mm-hmm. But if your tissues have a very high expression of androgen receptor it's the anti-androgenic effect you're going to feel the most, right? So this means things like prostate, gonads, brain, um, let's say like liver, uh, spleen, thymus, all of these uh, 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 express the androgen receptor very highly. So so the, effect, the this, in these tissues, finasteride will primarily, quote-unquote, shine. I mean, it's not a good effect, of course. It's going to shine as an, est- and an, as an androgen blocker. And in other tissues, such as potentially your scalp, maybe, you know, over there, it's pro progesterone, it's and a slight anti-estrogenic effects that works. I, I'll find the study, but I, and I'll send it to you. It, it, it did show that in some tissues, finasteride does have anti-estrogenic effects. So that may be why it has, why, why, why it regrows hair. Awesome. Okay, what, uh, the, the aspirin article... The antihistamines. What about the, di- high, the diabetes? High carb? Yeah, I think the high carb and diabetes. Yeah. Okay. I, I saw this. Um, and basically, like it was, <laughs> it was so it was so funny. So the moderators try to try to ban it, try to remove the study because it's old. Huh. It violates the rules <laughs> of the subreddit, the science subreddit. 
because it's like it was published in the 1970s. And then people kept reposting and reposting and reposting, and I think eventually Reddit gave up. And then it was funny to see the reactions of some of the doctors that are already on the science subreddit. Um, you know, like, I don't want to be around when the truth finally comes out because if it does turn out that we've been giving people diabetes with these low-carb diets and these, like, um, sulfonylurea drugs and, and telling them to restrict carbs and, you know, eat more fat. They're like, they're going to sue us out of existence, et cetera, et cetera. But anyways, long story short, it turns out it's not just one study. A number of studies, and uh, many people blame Ray about this as well. They say, oh, yeah, you talk about, uh, you know, high sugar diet helping diabetes. But that's like one guy who did experiments in the 1890s, right? And I'm like, uh, and you know, and I looked into this, and it looks like it's not just this one guy. There is actually evidence, virtually like five to ten studies every decade, which are showing conclusively, and they're all with humans. They're all with humans. So all of the criticism about, you know, all these diets not being like um, all the results about the high carb diets not being really relevant because most of the studies are with rodents. That's recent. Actually, if you look at the older studies, most of them are with Human that I linked to in that post, they were all with humans. So the diet that actually had 85% carbs, those were simple carbs. There were no starches, right? So it's, I mean, it wasn't sucrose, but it was like dextro, dextrose and maltose. So it's still pretty similar, right? Um, and then the, it was a fat-free diet. So 85% sugar diet and 50% protein essentially um, like basically like strongly improved the glycemic control in insulin dependent diabetes that that is that is truly the striking finding here mm -hmm. we're not talking about type 2 diabetes which many people many doctors even now say it's not a real disease all it means you're fat you need to lose some weight and you'll be you know back you know back to normal right no this was actually studied with insulin dependent di 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 diabetic people and then it links to a bunch of other studies which one of them used rice as the source of carbs the extra carbs right that also worked another one used sucrose that also worked. And I think another one used fruits. Uh, that also worked. So so we have a, a significant amount of, of uh, evidence. If you look at the, I added a total number of people that all, all of these studies looked at, and we're talking about five to 600. So that's sufficient for a clinical trial. And I know they're separate studies, right? But it's still, I mean, these, these people did not link to each other. They did not reference each other's research except for the latest one, which referenced all the others. So we're looking at about 600 people in whom um, about a third of them were, in, were type 1 diabetics, right? The others were type 2. And in all of these people, there was drastic improvement in insulin sensitivity by eating more simple carbs. If that doesn't, if that's not enough to, for people to start questioning seriously the whole theory about like avoiding sugar and avoiding simple carbs specifically, then I don't, I don't know what, what will be. Um, but, you know, um, I think that to me, the greatest indicator was that as soon as this was posted on a major social media site, the moderators were all over it trying to ban it. So similar, so <laughs> if they try to ban it so hard, there's something in that study that, 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 that uh, the powers that be don't want you to see. Um, it cannot be, I mean, again, if, if you're concerned about, you know, if, if you think this is crap research and, you know, it's really not representing of the science, then leave it be. People will read it. They'll tear it apart. Somebody will come along and say, oh, I didn't, I don't like the methods. They actually didn't, they didn't use, uh, uh, you know, uh, simple sugars. They used something else. None, we didn't have any of that. They just simply try to ban it. And eventually, by people posting it, different people posting it, you should see the comments underneath people were like oh what's next chemotherapy is bad for us <laughs> so i was thinking of comments and saying like well i mean it grew out of the chemical weaponry industry so uh <laughs> since since <laughs> you mentioned it should be walking up. yeah exactly <laughs> uh something that i thought was funny when i posted my like two-year carnivore diet review is uh not a not a lot but there were a handful of comments that were like you're a vegan and that's why you're you're dumping on the carnivore diet. And I, I found it to be so strange because if you watched like any of the video, I was like at one part in the video, I specifically said, like, I think animal products are great. And so right. sim simpler t similar to the vaccination stuff and everything in the culture there, uh, it, it's everything is politicized, you know, and even in the diet world, it's like 
it's high carb is associated with veganism and then low carb is this like cool carnivore animal product stuff and so i think it, i think it even especially now it's like really hard to get out of these camps because um maybe there's a concentrated effort to politicize everything <laughs> you know to polarize people into different groups and so I, I think that is why. One of the why are vegans considered high carb? I mean, aren't they eating mostly like uh, like insoluble fiber? Like uh, you know, I don't know, like leg, not legumes, but, but yeah, maybe legumes as well. But um, uh, all the vegans that I know, they they survive. I don't want to say thrive because they don't thrive. They survive primarily on salads and nibbling on like things like nuts. And some kind of you know green vegetables, of course, all of them raw, right? Um, it sounds to me like they're eating mostly undigestible carbs. Um, why is high carb associated with veganism? I, th well, I think there are different factions online, you know, but I think the the I think a lot or may maybe many people would agree that uh, uh, especially the fruitarians they emphasize carbohydrates yeah. in a big way, yeah, and sure. so they are. I think maybe they've fallen out of favor a little bit, but. I, well, I think the some of the mainstream uh, vegan authors like um, Bern, Bernard or Bernstein, I forget his name, and then another uh, a few of the other ones I'm aware of, they emphasize low fat, especially for diabetes. So if you're going low fat, you have to fill your calories with carbohydrate, and they're also yep. uh, against yep. protein. So, yeah, man, I think uh, yeah, it should be interesting to see how things play out. I was looking for the Tavistock Rockefeller Foundation. Um, oh, here it is. Um, I summarized this, but it says the Rockefeller Fund and Tavistock Institute found that setting groups, e.g. gender, ethnicity, skin color, sexual orientation, religion, region, into competition under austerity, induced self-brainwashing, the creation of perverse pseudo-families, and outright clinical psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good stuff. Thank you guys so much for watching. We're having a little bit of uh, some technical hiccups. I think I'm sharing the internet with like this whole hotel. And so I'm sure somebody might have might have jumped on their phone or iPad and occasionally your audio is getting a little glitchy for me. I hope it's not that bad on your guys' end. Um, please like this episode if you're enjoying it. That really helps Georgie and I. And the things we talk about, I don't think put us very high in the Google algorithm. So it's really up to you guys if people see these episodes. Um, follow Georgie on Twitter, twitter.com slash hate it. Uh, go to idealabsdc.com. Follow me on uh, Instagram. I do coaching on dannyroddy.com slash resources, and you can follow me on Twitter and also um, Telegram. Uh, aspirin, Georgie? Uh, sure, let's see. Which one? Oh, yeah, the Protex. Um, I don't think this will come as a surprise. I mean, basically, it's a pretty standard study uh, in the sense that, well, I mean, the surprise here is that it did not work through the COX mechanism. We talk to a doctor and say, oh, yeah, yeah, aspirin is just a COX inhibitor. The kill a bunch of people and got got pulled from the market. This shows that it's actually it acts through multiple anti-inflammatory mechanisms, uh, and that's it's really the increasing inflammation that apparently leads to the mitochondrial breakdown. Um, and uh, and increased mitochondrial breakdown has is seen with aging and a virtu virtually every chronic disease out there. So it has been a mystery, uh, but what medicine even as you know as, as lost as they are they said yes we are seeing increased mitochondrial breakdown we also we are we also are seeing increased inflammation in virtually every chronic disease and aging and now the study says they're actually related it's the inflammation that leads to mitochondrial breakdown and actually mitochondrial breakdown allows for even more inflammation to occur and it's aspirin that actually kind of puts a break on that mechanism through the master, one of the master inflammatory mediators known as NFKB, nuclear factor kappa B, I think is the, the actual enzyme name. Um, and, uh, you know, if you read the study, they say that they think that, you know, this mechanism of aspirin should allow, should be, should, should, should allow it to be used for treating a number of different mitochondrial diseases and potentially even, you know, aging in general. And it immediately reminded me, and I linked to that in my site, um, it was a study. <laughs> okay, we're we're back. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, that was this is a first, and so okay. So you guys could hear us in the other stream. Okay, I had no idea what was going on. YouTube said that the stream had ended, and so I just don't know. Uh, I didn't know what to do, and so if I, I went to the thing and it said stream was over, 
And so I, I, I didn't know of a way to restart that. Anyways, <laughs> I think we should be better now because we did a lower uh, bandwidth video. And so hopefully, th I mean, right now, uh, knock on wood, uh, things seem okay. Georgie? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can okay. We can. What? Well, let's do the the COVID. Okay. Raising NAD levels may be therapeutic for COVID nineteen. Yeah. I mean, the it's a German study. Actually, several of them. Um, and I think they it started as an in vitro study showing that uh, the the immune system response depends on energy, of course, like anything else, right? So it shouldn't come as a surprise. And then one of the first things that happens when a virus actually infects a cell is a dramatic drop in the mitochondrial. NAD to the NADH ratio. So the cell actually becomes less energetic and, you know, in other ways, uh, put it in a way, it's in a much more reduced state. And consequently, raising NAD levels uh, was highly therapeutic and prevented, both prevented infections um, of other cells with the virus and also inhibited the replication of the virus the infected cells. Okay, <laughs> it was a little, little, little sketchy, mm -hmm. but we, I, I understood all of that. Um, so anything okay. else on this, or <laughs> should we move on? Uh, the SSRI drugs, the last one is the one I want to mention, is because um, th that's a pretty. I think it's a pretty not not that it comes as a surprise to 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 your listeners and to the other pitarians, but um, you know, one of the one of the dogmas in medicine is that people with depression are uh, lack empathy. Uh, people in general with mental disorders are saying these people lack empathy. Um, and this is has has been used, and to this day, it's codified in DSM version five. I think at this point, it's actually a core symptom of pretty much any disorder. And and the the doctor, the psychiatrist, will try to evaluate you using an, a, a a bunch of different questionnaires. You know, what's your level of empathy? And this study <laughs> says no, it's actually not. It's not the mental disorder that makes you less empathetic. In other words, the opposite of empathetic. Uh, so it's not the it's really not the, the the mental disorder that makes you lack empathy for others, but it's the treatment with the very SSRI drugs, the ones that are supposed to cure it. Um, so yet another proof that as, that serotonergic drugs turn you into a psychopath. Um, so now there there's a I think they're trying to very quickly behind the scenes scramble and remove the measurement of empathy as a uh, as a symptom of mental disease. Now they're saying, oh my God, we're the ones doing it. <laughs> So uh, we we need to change the DSM as quickly as we can. <laughs> did, uh, sorry to keep bringing it back to coronavirus, but did you see the, uh, maybe it was in China, like the kids eating lunches and then they have cardboard cutouts like in between them by chance? No, uh, I didn't see that. Like why? To protect I guess themselves? it's really like horrifying to see. It's like the kids having lunches, but they have cardboard on the front and side of them and like they can't see the other students. It looks really super terrible. Oh, something similar. It wasn't lunch. It was a journey playing on the playground, mm -hmm. restricted by these, um, like, it's almost like fences made by nets. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're seeing cages of individual prisoners, and they're being prevented from establishing contact with each other. Mm -hmm. And the article was by a person, uh, I think she's a psychologist, a German psychologist, saying, this looks ridiculous. Like, the very, the very point of going to the playground is to interact with other children. That's how children grow and become humans. If we're going to keep them in cages, I mean, what's the point of having playgrounds? What's the point of having society mm. if we're not going to interact with each other? Mm. So uh, I think this, I mean, th this may actually spur some pushback. The fact that not so much that they're of the lockdown, but the fact that they're trying to turn humans into uh, into anti into anti antisocial animals if anything i think that may actually f face the biggest pushback than than anything else not so much the re working remotely not so much wearing masks but telling people you know what you can't really see each other anymore you can't really interact with each other anymore except over a computer i think that that may actually be the last straw and, and people will just um, not take to the streets but they'll start ignoring what's coming from tv which may have the same beneficial effects as not going to the hospital Okay, guys, I have the number up. Uh, give us a call. This is probably the worst idea ever, considering we're having bandwidth issues. <laughs> but I, I was excited about taking calls, and it, it changes up the show. And so I appreciate it. Uh, so here's the number, one five three zero three five nine eight three four two. And if that's an expensive number to call, you can always call us via Skype and the, the Skype credits. That's actually how I call Ray. Um, so give us, Georgie, give us an update on Idea Labs, and then if somebody calls, we can uh, segue into that. 
what's oh yeah the uh, DHT study with, with prostate cancer mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't it wasn't hold because the lab that I used was in Taiwan and it got shut down because of the virus but now they're slowly restarting unfortunately we we'll, we'll, you know we'll kind of have to almost restart the study from scratch because you can't just you know all the animals that were being treated they got killed because you know the like the lab had to shut down so about a month and a half of work is down the drain the good news is they're not going to charge me to study because they're saying it's not my fault. It's not their fault either, but we, you know, I guess they want to keep me as a client. So we're going to restart the DHT study. Uh, it's actually, it's already started. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to now this time have something, um, you know, some preliminary results, results within a month. I already posted, made a post about the Corinon. Both studies have been published. I'll send you the link with the second one. Yeah, actually, it's on the blog. If you if you need it, if somebody, anybody asks for it, the actual in vivo study with Corinon Plus uh, is already published. Um, what what else? Oh, there is another one ongoing right now with Pyroset and Oxidel. Uh, same tumor. We want to see if basically uh, inhibiting fatty acid oxidation and lowering lactate lactic acid production, right, with Oxidel, and you know improving mitochondrial function. If that's going to have a beneficial effect on a cancer, uh, so far it looks really promising. It looks better. The results look better than Corinone. Um, we're also doing a bunch of um, in vitro testing um, with pregnenolone and DHEA on, on uh, I think it's like breast cancer, prostate cancer, and liver cancer. And if those things, if, if we get some good results, we may follow up with an in vivo study as well. Um, what else? I mean, there's I have a group that's working on synthesizing a fatty acid oxidation inhibitor and a generic serotonin antagonist similar to cyproheptadine, but without the sedative properties. So it's a lot of exciting stuff. It's just hard to work right now because everybody is everybody is, is under orders to basically stay at home, and you know they're trying to do a lot of this work remotely. But when you're working with animals and trying to actually synthesize chemicals out of thin air, it doesn't it it, does, it cannot happen over a computer. So it's it's taking time. But a lot of things going on. Nothing's been shut down, and I you know if I'm hoping to continue expanding and. Um, I, I really, I really have high hopes for the DHT study. I mean, like I told you before, the results of that first phase before it got shut down were really positive. Basically, the animals getting DHT were essentially getting cured. Um, if we can replicate that that again now and get it published, more importantly, um, I think it will be. Um, I think it, will, it, it, it may actually hit mainstream news. Is my hope. I've already talked to a, a few journalist friends that were they're journalists, but they're kind of interested in medicine. So they they know about the hypothesis of DHT causing boldness in prostate cancer. They're saying, you know, if it's in a reputable journal, it's not Bob's blog or George's blog or whatnot. They may be able to <laughs> to send it to the editor and say, hey, we should cover it, right? At least even if it's peripheral. So uh, little by little, I mean, I'm I'm doing my part to to pull this whole house of cards down. Uh, it's it's way overdue, and I, and I think many people even peripherally are now starting to understand that it's a house of cards and they may actually pull it down before me, you know, like just stop going to the doctor. <laughs> they, they may do more than any studies about DHT I'll ever do, right? Um, you know, just people en masse losing faith in medicine and saying enough, you know, I need my money in my pocket, not in the doctor's pocket. And guess what? I'm feeling better as well. So I don't need you guys with the white coats. Good stuff. Okay, we don't we, no calls. Okay, that which is fine. A little bit of a bummer, but um, <laughs> let's go through the super chats, and then we can you guys can call if you want to. Um, let me catch up here. Uh, high carb, five high carb. Okay, this one's from Sven A. Thank you so much, uh, Sven. He says uh, for twenty kr, which I don't know, or knock. I don't know what that is. Uh, he says... Um, Norwegian Kronos. Uh, I think. Nice. Thank you, Georgie. He says, if you, uh, if you got a benign liver tumor, how would you cure? Oh, it's, it's one of the... It's just like breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive. This is probably the, uh, one of the clearest signs of estrogen excess. I would do the uh, typical you know, test for prolactin, estrogen, and cortisol. Um, and uh, I think large oral doses of progesterone and vitamin E would probably be the most benign. Um, there's some, there are basically some older studies with androgens. Uh, they weren't oral, but androgens injected. I think they used testosterone, and those studies said non-aromatizable androgens like dihydrotestosterone should work even better. 
So anything to lower estrogen, um, whether you're going to inhibit aromatase, whether you're going to block estrogen, the receptor, um, whether you're going to increase its excretion by the liver, for which vitamin B1 and B2 are really crucial, or B3 as well, anything anything to keep estrogen low and also anything to keep endotoxin low because um, multiple studies have shown, they're all animal studies, but pretty reliable showing that endotoxin by itself can actually cause liver tumors even even when the hormonal profile is is not disturbed. Um, so keeping the gut clean, you know, potentially doing a course of antibiotics, uh, especially if it's the tetracyclines because they they themselves have anti-estrogenic properties. Um, you know, there are multiple options, but the the main cause, the main the direct cause is likely elevated estrogen, uh, and endotoxin most likely plays a big role there as well. Sweet. Thank you so much, Georgie. Thank you, Sven, for that uh, 20 knock. Um, Sam Empey for 999. Thank you so much, Sam. He says, uh, how to treat a, a venous leak? Also, what to uh, what do you think is a good level for blood sugar? Uh, I were a CGM and my overnight fasting is 100 and spiked 150, 60, 150 to 160 for a couple hours after each meal. So about, uh, let's see, it, it, if the venous leak, in general, capillary leaks are caused by increasing and, and often nitric oxide as well. So anything to lower these two usually helps. In fact, I think there's a, there's a clinical trial right now. Actually, there's a drug approved for uh, leakage. It's a, it's a peripheral serotonin antagonist, and it's called sarpogrelate. Um, and it's approved in Japan. It's a Japanese, um, and it seems to not be able to cross the blood-brain barrier, but they're using it because it's, perif- it's acting mostly peripherally. They're using it to treat vascular complications of diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease, and one of those complications is vascular leakage. Um, so serotonin antagonist, if you can get that, obviously cyproheptin is also a side low or at least opposing its effects is likely very therapeutic um have a few clients that have used methylene blue uh, which is very potently both lowers nitric oxide and can actually scavenge it directly when it's already in the blood uh who managed to uh they had huge like purple bruises on their lower like below the knees and the doctor basically said this is just you know your, your blood vessels are leaking and and they happen to have diabetes um, and, um, you know, they, uh, uh, methylene blue seem to be able to clear it up. Now they still get some blueness when they exert themselves, but you know, they used to that, that, that purple, these purple spots used to stay and never disappear. And now when they basically, when they take the methylene blue, they, the blue spot, the blue spots disappear until they overexert themselves. Mm-hmm. So that would be my recommendation as uh, an anti, an anti serotonin drug and, uh, and things that keep nitric oxide low. Niacinamide is also a great way to lower nitric oxide. Speaking of blood glucose, before I turn my lights on, <laughs> um, if you look at older studies, you will see that actually your blood sugar range that you just mentioned, 150 to 160 after meals, it was considered normal. It actually was considered a good insulin response to a, to a meal with a high glycemic index. And the normal levels of, of fasting blood sugar in the morning was anything under 120. If you go, if your blood sugar is between 100 and 120 right now, your doctor will freak out and call you a pre-diabetic mm-hmm. and put you on a very hardcore diet trying to lower it. But all the way up until the mid uh, the I'm sorry, the mid 80s, uh, up until 120 was considered normal. Between 120 and 150 was considered pre-diabetes, and only over 150 that your doctor will start to get worried, especially if it's sustained. But having a good insulin response after a meal is actually great. Shows your pancreas is working. And, you know, just because it's 150, 160, that by itself doesn't say much. In, I mean, the doctor should be actually testing it several hours lower as well, uh, several hours after the meal. So two, three, four, five, six hours. I mean, you should be testing the insulin. And if it's dropping, then this is perfectly normal. It's anything else going on. It's not necessarily the sugar issue. But I, um, you know, I don't think blood sugar in, uh, you know, between 100 and 120 is a reason for concern. Yeah, I just wave. <laughs> yeah, take your time. Good. I think uh, for what it's worth, Ray, uh, somebody asked Ray a similar question, and he said the peak didn't matter much as long as it came down after a few hours. And so, 
similar to what George, you just said there. Um, so th thank you so much, Sam. Sincerely appreciate it. Um, we're all good. Chat, how are you doing? Is Georgie breaking up when he's he's talking? I don't know if that's my Skype. I don't know if that's being rerouted into uh, Streamlabs, but it is. It's way less than it was before. That's uh, yeah. I, I I mean, for the last ten minutes, I haven't heard any any like freezing or breaking breaking okay. up. We'll see. I mean, oh, we we have a call. Okay, perfect timing. Okay, let's. Uh, nice. I think I can merge this right. Um, answering this call, place your current call on hold, or you can merge. Call. Okay, merge call. Hello, you are on air. Who is this? Hello. Hello. Oh, we have a call. Okay, perfect timing. How are you? Good. How are you? You're gonna have to turn off our audio on your computer. Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, Hello? <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Just, just, just mute. Oh, mute no worries. Just mute your, your computer audio. There we go. Okay. We cool. How, how are you? Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm calling from uh, Boston. Awesome. How are you? And what is your question? I'm doing well. Thank, thank both of you so much for your work. It's been life changing. I wanted to ask uh, about your thoughts on adaptogens. Uh, Dr. Pete has spoken favorably. I've heard him speak favorably about uh, Siberian ginseng and rhodiola. Uh, and I just was interested in on your thoughts on those two compounds in addition to ashwagandha. Roger, did you catch it? Do you want me to say, yeah, yeah. So ashwagandha, I think, is used in. Okay, we're back. Uh, thanks, guys, for putting up with that. There are literally no not creating a new one of these. And so uh, nine concurrent viewers, but we'll just keep we'll keep going. So, Georgie, you want to finish answering the rest of that question? Yeah, I was saying that uh, the, 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 the Siberian ginseng and rhodiola rosea, are, they, have, they have a number of very good studies, uh, some of them going back to the 1960s. Um, the thing, uh, so uh, the thing that concerned me about these herbs is that um, several studies show that if you're using the uh, a water-based extract, uh, so called, uh, uh, from the herb, uh, it had estrogenic effects. They did some tests on like basically the growth of this and the mammary glands of animals, and uh, this, these extracts, the water portion of it, clearly had estrogenic effects. But if it was an ethanol extract. Uh, or a supercritical CO2 extract, it did not have estrogenic effect. So uh, usually if you're buying a ginseng extract, you'll say on the back, like many of them are patented, you'll say what kind of an extract is. It would usually be like something like G dash and it'll have some numbers and like a registered trademark. So it means somebody patented it. If you Google that, it'll tell you what kind of an extract is it. So uh, it seems that uh, for several of the adaptogens, uh, taking a water-based extract is, you know, it's something, some estrogenic molecules that are in the herb. Um, so try to not use a water-based extract. Ethanol, the ethanol extract seems to be much safer. Same thing for Tribulus terrestris, which is also considered an, um, uh, an adaptogen. And for ashwagandha, just to repeat, um, it has some very good track record in Ayurvedic medicine um, as basically a drug that can treat for serotonin, lower blood glucose, etc. But there are several published cases uh, with commercially available products causing liver toxicity. Um, and one of them uh, opined that this is likely due to heavy metal contamination. So um, when, you're, when you're about to buy the extract, if you're buying like a commercial product of, uh, of ashwagandha, do some research, see if there is any published case studies on that causing any kind of liver issues. Um, and if possible, get the herb yourself. Like, um, you know, uh, there's quite a few... Uh, ethnic stores in the United States selling so you can get it yourself and, and make a tea or like even make an extract yourself. They'll be probably safer than buying a commercial product. But if you are buying a commercial product, just, just do a quick search in PubMed or even in Google, you know, type the product name or like the company name and space and then liver toxicity or just liver issues and, and see what comes up. Um, even if people report it on forums and uh, you should be able to find um, any kind of, you know, bad, bad feedback if there is about the specific product. And Matthew, uh, he did another super chat for four ninety nine. Thank you so much, Matthew. He says, uh, "I should have asked for thoughts on ginkgo biloba as well." Uh, 
Inco Biloba also has some very good reports. The ones that I'm aware of is that lo it lowers prolactin um, and it's dopaminergic. Uh, it's also been shown to reverse sign of dementia in animal models. Um, and in fact, there are two or three patented extracts with ginkgo that are now available in, in the United States as well um, that, are, that are in clinical trials in China for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I think ginkgo, ginkgo has a lot of promise. Again, the, it comes down to are you really getting the real thing um, if, if it's a watered-down extract or if it's contaminated with something else, you know, th that could make it, you know, not work as, as planned. But as far as the actual plant is concerned, um, I think it has some good track record of being pro-dopaminergic, um, you know, increasing vasodilation in the brain, improving, improving blood flow in the brain, cognitive function, even in young people. And actually some people are using it. They call it like poor man's Adderall. So if you can't get Adderall, like you, you, some people load up on paracetam and ginkgo biloba, um, and they're saying it's giving them similar effects. Thank you for that, and thank you, Matthew. Uh, Cheesy Boy six five four says, "Hello, friends. Would it be safe to store pure DMSO in old Idea Labs bottles, or will this risk leaching plastic?" Thank you for five dollars. Thank you, thank you, Cheesy Boy. Um, we did we did some testing on on leach, so called leachables, and basically we sent some lab we sent some bottles to the lab back at uh, back in the in the day when we're still using DMSO. And some of these bottles had stuff in them, uh, basically the DMSO and ethanol mix um, for at least six months, some of them up to 12, and none of them showed any leaching. Now, I think it really depends on the bottle. If you're using our bottles, I would be, you know, I'll be more comfortable. But if you have bottles, then, then, you know, you should ask the vendor to send you a detailed description of what the bottle is made of. Um, you know, many times they'll, they'll say, oh, it's a LDPE, um, you know, leach resistant bottle, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that it's an actual HDPE, high density, uh, high density polyethylene, which uh, tends to leach more. Um, so if you're using our bottles, I think it should be okay for several months. And so itself starts to break down after about three to four months unless you're keeping it in the fridge. Um, and you can tell that it's breaking down because DMSO by itself, when it's fresh, when not fresh, but like when it's, when it's actually stable and it's been recently synthesized, it has no smell. The garlic smell only happens when DMSO starts to break down under the, uh, when it's exposed to air. Um, so if you're using the our bottles to store, that's fine, but I wouldn't do it for more than three to four months. It's just because of the DMSO itself will actually start breaking down. Sweet. Thank you for that, Cheesy Boy. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, Elliot Cactus for $7.99. Uh, AUD, is that Australian? I don't know. Yeah, Australian um, dollars. He says, uh, in the case of a fever, should one continue to take thyroid? Would it make body or would it make the body temperature higher? Uh, it really, really depends on the fever. I think if it's a, of a bacterial origin, um, what was that saying? Um, start of a fever? No, start a start start of a cold and feed a fever or something. Mm -hmm. I think that there was there was this old old wife um, old wife tales remedy. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on the infection. I would actually try an anti-serotonin remedy before jumping on the thyroid. Um, in my experience, aspirin actually helps regardless if it's a bacterial or viral issue. And then it will adjust the body's response depending on, on what the pathogen is. It's hard to know. For, there aren't really any, any reliable tests. You can do a complete blood count. And if the white blood cells are elevated, it's usually considered a bacterial infection. If they're low, it's considered viral. But it's not a hundred percent reliable um, test, um, so go for the aspirin, and you know take like a gram or like you know two three tablets, the equivalent of two three tablets, um, uh, the American version, or like two tablets European because they're five hundred milligrams each, and see how that affects you. Uh, this way, you don't have to guess whether it's viral or bacterial. Great stuff. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, from Jaeger ODA for four ninety nine US. Thank you so much, Jaeger. He says how to mimic the Russian. Duchess cocktail with legal steroids. <laughs> well, uh, you can ex I mean, you can completely mimic it, but uh, I made a thread on the forum about three years ago. Um, I think I called it something along the lines of structural requirements for an optimal anti-catabolic steroid. So uh, most of the most of the so-called anabolic effects of steroids are actually due to their anti-catabolic effects. In fact, about eighty percent of them are due to blockade of the cortisol receptor. So um, 
taking things that block the cortisol receptor, such as progesterone specifically, is pretty potent. And then DHEA was another one. So you, you probably get most of the anti-catabolic effects just by using a combination of uh, progesterone and DHEA. And then um, the, also like about, about 20% of the anabolism from steroids is due to uh, or, um, you know, um, activating the androgen receptor, which increases protein synthesis. So for that, uh, the only the closest thing legally would be something like androsterone or again DHEA. Um, so it's hard to really mimic the Duchess cocktail because it uses it uses three pretty potent steroids that are very hard to mimic with uh, over the counter steroids. I think you use trembolone, methanolone, and and one more that I'm, I'm forgetting right now, uh, and you use pretty high doses. Mm. Um, the, in one of the interviews, the guy who, in, the Russian guy who invented it, said they used one milligram of steroid per gram of alcohol in the <laughs> drink. So, it, in in Russia, they usually drink 100 milliliters of vodka per per single drink. That means 40 grams of alcohol inside, and which means 40 gram 40 milligrams of each of these steroids: mm-hmm. trembolone, metanolone, and the third one. And that's not a small dosage. It's nothing to laugh at be very hard to mimic that with over-the-counter steroids, but you can get pretty close with, say, about 50 milligrams progesterone, 10 milligrams HEA, and probably 5 to 10 milligrams of androsterone. Um, again, your mileage may vary, but that's about as close as you can get with legal ones. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jaeger. Uh, Ellie Z, my buddy, for $2 USD. Thank you so much, Ellie. He says, excellent info on anti-aromatases and estrogen. Thank you so much, Ellie. Steve uh, Gra- uh, Grables, Grables for Canadian $5. Thank you, Steve. He says, thoughts on the safest way to lose weight as an obese person, metabolic foods at a caloric deficit with appropriate supplementation? Question mark. Um, so it really depends. In, in, my, in my experience, most people with severe weight problems, um, this is an endocrine issue. So I would do a you know, full hormonal profile, things like especially cortisol, prolactin, DHEA, total testosterone, vitamin D. Is there? I had three, two or three clients email me recently saying that they managed to drop significant amounts of weight by doing sublingual vitamin D. Um, one of them used our calcerol product. The others just used regular vitamin D tablets and crushed them with their teeth and kept them under their tongue for a while. They said the effects was nothing like the oral. I mean, basically, the apparently it absorbs much better, um, and it, it it raised their levels pretty quickly, pretty pretty uh, significantly, um, uh, compared to what they were they were doing. You know, the same dosages orally for months, and there wasn't much of a change. Um, so vitamin base, there's almost an, a perfect inverse correlation between vitamin D levels and levels of fat mass. So it's not just the total weight you need to be looking at. You need to be looking at and so if you look at vitamin D levels and actual fat mass, they're almost perfectly inversely correlated levels and doing taking steps to correct any other hormonal imbalances, especially if there are things like high cortisol, high prolactin, low DHA, low testosterone, that would be very important. And also uh, keeping the gut clean. There have been a number of uh, studies recently that show that uh, if you sterilize the guts of mice, you can literally cure even morbid obesity pretty quickly. Now, of course, mo- most doctors would balk at that, the prescribing antibiotics to, to sterilize the gut completely. But, you know, just, um, you know, charcoal, even if you're not, if you, even if you're not sterilize it completely, taking charcoal twice a week, in, in my experience, helps a lot uh, reduce endotoxin. Uh, most of the accumulation of fat, uh, aside from the lower thyroid function, is actually due to a chronic inflammatory reaction from the endotoxin, which triggers a chronic, a mild but chronic elevation of cortisol. And when cortisol is high, you're both synthesizing more fat in the, any fat and anything that gets uh, kind of ingested through your diet, the fat you're immediately storing as well, and also the carbs, if cortisol is high, instead of synthesizing glycogen, the cortisol activates the enzyme fatty acid synthase, so you're converting part of the carbs as well to fat. Um, so I would investigate the hormonal angle and, you know, make sure that the endotoxin um, you know, issue is, is addressed as well. And again, vitamin D level is very important. It seems that, again, if you look at the studies, there's almost a perfect inverse correlation between vitamin D and fat mass. Do anything you can to raise your levels to at least 40. 
Um, that seems to be a, about the optimal level. Higher levels don't seem to provide benefit, and low, lower levels, even as low as the 30s, which is still in range, um, you know, you already seem to be at risk for a number of different chronic conditions. I put up the photos of the before and after the people with thyroid therapy. And then um, also I have on here, I know you've seen it before, that 1979 paper that says the obesity of middle age, a common variety of Cushing syndrome. Uh, so, so the, str the stress yeah. increasing as a person gains weight in middle age. Okay, so we'll, we could probably say more about that one, but we should jump to more of these. Um, uh, our... R.B. Longfellow for five dollars. Uh, thank you so much, R.B. Much love to Idea Labs. Great products. So this is not a criticism. I tried Camphosol two days since and very bloated. Any ideas how to mitigate this? Um, I I the bet from Camphosol is when people took it on an empty stomach first thing in the morning, uh, and then it seemed to stimulate a bowel movement and the 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 bloating. Uh, the bloating repose that I got was usually from people that took it with food. I don't know why. I mean, you know, all I did with this product is essentially combine in dosages that were reported in the older studies to sterilize the, the small intestine. Uh, also, um, depending uh, on how you're taking it, if you take with a little bit of charcoal, you may be able to actually get the camphosal and, and have a significant amount of it reach the column. Um, so... The, when, when all the studies said, said intestinal sterilization, they mostly meant the small intestine. So camphosal should work pretty well to sterilize, you know, reverse issues such as SIBO, SIBO, right? Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But to get to the colon and, and exert its effects there, it usually works best um, when you combine it with something like charcoal because it's going to absorb on the charcoal and, you know, not, not absorb systemically but get taken to the colon where you'll have effect on the microbiome. Uh, Ray recommended something similar about coconut oil. People were saying, if coconut oil is such a strong antibacterial, how, how come I'm not feeling the effects? And Ray's response was, because it's getting absorbed and metabolized. If you want to really experience its antibacterial effect, you have to get it to the colon. So, you know, of course, enema, you know, is one way, but uh, another way more convenient probably is taking it with a little bit of charcoal. The a significant portion of it binds to the charcoal and gets to the colon where, you know, it can really show, shine it as, a, as an antenna for the, for the camphoric acid and the, uh, and the, and the salol in the camphor cell. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, RB Longfellow. Uh, Michael, uh, for $50 um, pesos. Thank you so much, Michael. He says, how to treat subclinical -clin uh, thiamine deficiency or t t t t mean? i'm so stupid is that how you team thiamine yeah, yeah. uh how long is vitamin b1 yeah. yeah how long can one take a thousand milligrams of thiamine without uh imbalance to other vitamins the oral if you're taking the hydrochloride salt or the mon the mononitrate i don't recommend the latter one because it it, it can raise can it can provide sufficient amount of nitrates um, so that it raises your nitric oxide. So I would recommend using the hydrochloride salt. And if you do, um, there, were, there, there, was, there are several human studies showing that taking up to 1,500 milligrams daily didn't really cause any issues except minor, minor digestive upset, right? Um, so in order to correct it, there, it's, it's, you have to get a special test which measure, measures the level of time in, in the erythrocyte actually measures the level of the active time in time in pyrophosphate in the not only whether you're absorbing time but whether you're actually converting it to the active cofactor. So it's similar to if you take niacinamide, we know it absorbs, but are you is it raising your NAD levels? So there's actually a test for NAD uh, and the which can, and also the NAD agent can get the ratio. Same thing for thiamine. So it's one. It's so you, you should test for the blood levels of thiamine, and better yet, the levels of thiamine in erythrocytes, and also the levels of thiamine pyrophosphate before and after supplementation, and see if those levels are rising as well. If they're not rising, then then uh, you know you either need to up the thiamine dosage or use another type of thiamine, such as alithiamine, which has been shown that it can raise erythrocyte levels of thiamine pyrophosphate with much smaller dosages. 50 milligrams daily was was perfectly sufficient. But as far as taking higher doses of thiamine 
uh, for longer periods of time, I don't think you're running that much of a risk of uh, causing imbalances because not much of it absorbs. That's why such high doses are needed uh, with the plain salt is because it absorbs less efficiently than the than lipophilic versions such as alitiamine, benfotiamine, sulbutiamine, and surfotiamine. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, another one from Michael for 20 pesos. He says, uh, how to mix aspirin for topical use? Uh, aspirin doesn't dissolve very well. Um, and for topical use, the best thing is to dissolve a couple of tablets in a glass of warm water um, and then just apply on the skin. Or you can use vodka and try to dissolve it there because it will absorb better if, if there's a little bit of alcohol in the solution. Um, but aspirin, it's really not very soluble. It's it's not a it's a lip, lipophilic molecule, um, the benzoic acid core. Um, so so you know uh, water is, but it, you can dissolve a few tablets in a glass of water, and that should be enough for uh, surface issues such as acne, blemishes, moles, uh, scars. Like if you have any kind of wounds and you want to disinfect them. In you know, a bath slash warm water and stirring, it should dissolve it in the concentration sufficient to have these effects. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, Primitive initiative. Uh, hey, brother. He says uh, nine ninety nine uh, USD. He says debate over ideal ratio of magnesium to calcium. Uh, what are your views? Um, I don't. I mean, I don't know why is this debate. If you're taking too much calcium and you're re reaching a point where, where you are having too much calcium, you'll feel it. I mean, your jaw will start, will start clenching. Um, you'll start getting like like um, these twitching effects um, in your muscles. Um, and so far, I, I haven't heard from anybody who got to that point. Um, now, if you have a, an established magnesium deficiency and then you're taking a lot of calcium, that may be potentially a problem. But keep in mind, all of the electrolytes can fill in for each other partially. So it's not like when you're taking too much calcium, you're depleting your magnesium. You're not, um, you know. So so the whole thing about the ratio um, grew out of studies that showed that optimal nerve conductance happened at a ratio of calcium to magnesium of two to one, but it wasn't something that was done in vivo in humans to see that. And that's the only thing, that's the only thing they measured. I don't know of any studies that show that a, a ratio of two to one calcium to magnesium is required for optimal, I don't know, cardiovascular health or, you know, for, or for, for, um, for optimal thyroid health. Um, if anything, it's the calcium that's known to raise temperature and improve the function of the Krebs cycle. Magnesium is a cofactor for uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, and it, do, it is a cofactor for many other reactions, but in my experience, calcium raises uh, metabolism a lot more visibly than magnesium does. Magnesium is more is is more um, more nutrient. And by the way, if you if you if your uh, metabolism is not already working well, you won't retain much magnesium no matter how much you're taking, uh, because its retention depends on ATP in the organism, and those levels themselves depend on metabolism, for which calcium is much more uh, you know conducive in in terms of increasing than magnesium. So. So calcium and magnesium go hand in hand, and I don't think one depletes the other. So I, I wouldn't be personally chasing ratios unless there is already established magnesium deficiency, which probably needs to be corrected anyways. But chasing specific ratios. Consume as much calcium as, as you can safely, which means probably up to five grams a day. And you know if you're taking 100 to 200 milligrams of magnesium daily as well, I think that should be fine. I know pl plenty of people who do just fine on that. So the whole thing about a specific ratio, I think it's a little bit re reminiscent of G-Ball's theories, you know, that you have to hit these special ratios, otherwise your health will fall apart. That's not how the organism, if it needs more of a specific nutrient, it will let you know. And, and uh, the calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium can actually fill in for each other if there is a specific deficiency of one. So they're not like... It, there's not, it's not like they're, they're completely antagonistic to each other. They have a, a number of different overlapping effects. Yeah, I had heard for many years that you had to have some specific ratio of the two. Didn't Ray had some article on one of his art, uh, a reference in one of his articles that said that I think um, kids with some kind of disease basically like peed out all of the calcium they had consumed that day in the nighttime. 
And so again, it's like just like you said, it's the the the, the metabolism is an important nutrient that needs to be factored into all of these things. And that and and also somebody asked Ray about like uh, an excess of calcium being dangerous in a magnesium deficiency. And Ray said something like everything's dangerous in a magnesium deficiency. <laughs> and so, so in a, in a thyroid, in a, when, when you're hypothyroid, everything's yeah, dangerous. Exactly. I, I, do, I do remember that yeah. quote. Yeah. So you're not going to correct that by chasing specific ratios. You may want to play with the ratios if you're feeling healthy and let's say like you're drinking a lot, you know, half a gallon of milk. And if you're drinking a half a gallon and eventually start getting these muscle twitches, then you may want to increase your magnesium intake as well. But until then, I wouldn't be trying to necessarily match the ratio of calcium to magnesium because if you're drinking half a gallon of milk, that's what, like three grams of calcium. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're taking one and a half grams of magnesium, according to that ratio, two to one, you will probably just, you know, you'll, you'll spend a lot of time in the bathroom. You, you won't be absorbing much of the milk either. Um, so it's, it's really, yeah, you have to take these specifically recommended ratios with a grain of salt. Um, it's more likely that, you know, that their, their findings are isolated to specific cases. And in this case, it will system function. Right. Uh, and, and it was just, that's what they found, uh, in the most optimal, uh, functions of the nerves. Right. But that they didn't measure cognitive function. They didn't measure memory. They didn't measure mood. It was just a, it was just a, you know, a bunch of nerves cut out and and, and measuring the, the the conductivity. And the assumption was that the, the the more easily electrical signals go from point to point, that you know that allows you for health of the nervous system. Sometimes it's true, not always. Awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you, Primitive Initiative. Thank you, Georgie. Harry, Harry Burgos, thank you so much, Harry, your continued support. And so many of, the, of you guys continually support the show, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Harry Burgos for $10. Uh, no message. Thank you, Harry. Another one from Matthew, Matthew for four ninety nine. He says, do... Are you there? Are you there? Yeah, I'm there, but... You okay, can yeah. <laughs> We're trying to get through this as fast as possible. Uh, Matthew says, do we men have a weaker hormonal profile when compared to women due to lower progesterone production, thus lower capacity for stress resilience? Um, I wouldn't say lower. I'd, I would say the hormonal profile is structured differently to protect from stress. When men are younger, uh, basically up to 12, we have about the same hormonal profile as, as women. Uh, you know, basically, um, actually, before puberty kicks in, we have virtually the same hormonal profile. And then after puberty kicks in, um, all the way up to, let's say, like early 20s, maybe mid 20s, we're fairly close, um, um, except during ovulation when women's profiles, hormonal profiles change because estrogen surges. But aside from that, our hormonal profile is not that much different. After that, basically, we get into a situation where the things that protect men are mostly DHEA and testosterone. Those are the, the stress protective uh, um, uh, hormones and pregnenolone as well. We don't produce as much progesterone after that 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 age time, that age that age uh, level. And then for women, it's the, it's the extra progesterone they produce because of the the fluctuations in the cycle and also the pregnancy, right? I mean, you have about nine months of pregnancy where towards the end of the pregnancy, a woman is producing. Uh, between five and seven, uh, between 500 and 700 milligrams of progesterone daily, a healthy woman. That it has a cumulative effect that lasts long after the pregnancy is done. So it's not that we have a worse hormonal profile. We have different hormones that are protective against cortisol and estrogen, and um, and with age, those decline as well. So for women, progesterone is the main protective factor, and the DHEA and they decline. And for men, it's pregnenolone. And all of these three happen to decline with age as well. I wouldn't call men res less resilient, um, you know, in terms of like what their hormonal profile is. But before puberty, we, we have about the same protective factors than women do in, the, in about the same levels. Well, I, I, I think Ray did say, I mean, not that Ray is the law of the land or anything. I think he did have in one of his articles that women tolerated hypothyroidism better than men. And so that would that would explain... Each during okay. childbearing age. If you look at postmenopausal mm -hmm. women, it's quite the mm -hmm. contrary, actually. Then then the roles get mm -hmm. reversed. Then they're much more susceptible to uh, to hypothyroidism, and they tolerate it less well than men do. And after about the age of 65, 
we again, men and women's hormonal profile becomes almost identical, which is high cortisol, high estrogen, high prolactin, and then low levels of all of the protective hormones. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, the listeners have probably seen uh, like older uh, males and females. They actually look pretty much alike. Um, you know, I've, uh, the, the, I think Yale did a study where they showed uh, people pictures of people that are 85 and older and then the the participants couldn't guess whether this is a male or a, uh, like a male mm -hmm. or a female and they dressed them in neutral clothing so you couldn't actually you know you couldn't use the clothes or like the hairstyle or makeup and whatnot so they were without makeup and they just wearing gender neutral clothes people could not guess which one was the male which was the female so it shows that you know um, you know after a certain age we, we become equally vulnerable and then before that age and in younger years each gen actors um you know i would say the men um i think ray said in one article after the age of 70 men can actually produce even more estrogen than postmenopausal women um and you can tell i mean it's not a coincidence that men develop gynecomastia when they get older um and then they start getting be, becoming susceptible to colon cancer which in younger years Women have a ratio of four to one uh, to men, just like the autoimmune conditions. But it, since that rate equalizes after the age of 65, it shows that estrogen, you know, more or less equalizes between the two sexes. And if the hormonal profile is the same, you would expect the the, the sexual dimorphism to mostly disappear if the hormonal pro pro profile equalizes. So what you're saying is that gender is just a social contract, uh, construct. No, just, just joking. Not. It's actually gender <laughs> is an environmentally determined <laughs> phenotype, or yeah, it's not. It's yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. But it's not a choice. I, I, <laughs> if anything, it's the choice to 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 choose a gender. You must be in a peculiar state of mind, so you should be checking your hormones if you're really feeling like your gender. I can't there believe I failed at the delivery of my joke. I'm so upset. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll continue here. Uh, you uh, didn't fail. <laughs> I just... Go ahead. Okay, Oren Frazier. Oh, no. Yeah, Oren Frazier for USD $5. Thank you so much, Oren. He says, what activities slash things slash compounds increase NAD and ATP? Also, androgens, if you want to touch on that. We have been talking about these androgens a lot, but... How would you increase NAD, ATP, and androgens? I mean, activities or supplements? I mean, I think as far as supplements, we've covered this like so many mm -hmm. times. In terms of activities that, that keeps dopamine high and serotonin low, which is unplanned, interesting, purposeful activities. Um, so definitely not office work, <laughs> uh, unless it's something that really you wanted to do and nobody's on your case um, to harassing you with projects plans and milestones and and whatever other you know like uh, idiotic inventions the bean counters have come up with to turn into another cog in you know cog in the, it's called what is it called cog in the wheel or like cog in the machine um so anything that's that's less planned will tend to stimulate creativity which in turn will will, will increase dopamine and will keep prolactin and estrogen low so if prolactin low you will have optimal amount of androgens um androgens by themselves specifically it's more like keeping the levels of the catabolic and feminizing hormones speaking of males of course um, low and allowing which allows the gonads to function properly and release the right amount of androgens you don't want them to if you're producing too much testosterone the excess will aromatize and you you will probably find yourself in a worse situation than than you know a person with less high testosterone Strong, but also lower estrogen too. Great stuff. Uh, Rami, uh, 80 for Canadian $2 says, do you still supplement eggshells? So uh, is he talking to me or are you? Did you ever supplement eggshells? A uh, long time ago, uh, around 2014, 15. I just found it too cumbersome to to produce the, the power. So I just switched to uh, mostly to dairy. I eat a lot of cheese. Recently, I found this milk uh, by Organic Valley which uh, it has less water in it, less less liquid, which means higher protein and higher calcium content. Unfortunately, I only have it in chocolate flavor. I personally don't like chocolate. I like vanilla, any flavor of chocolate. I don't mind it, but I think it would sell a lot more. And actually, here's how I confirmed it. My Two of my kids, uh, not 
all of my, but I have two kids. Both of my kids really like these um, like packed uh, sweetened milks by Organic Valley. They sell them in six packs and they have a vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. During the lockdown, when there were these long lines here in DC for like food, you, you walk into the store and actually there's even an article on CNN about it. It's like the, they call it the untouchable foods. What foods remain on the shelves and nobody wanted mm -hmm. to buy? And invariably, in every store I walked in, it was chocolate <laughs> milk. People did not want it. But the vanilla first disappeared. So I think if if somebody knows somebody in, in Organic Valley, uh, I think it's a co-op. It's not a it's not a corporation. It's a co-op. So there has to be a way for them to be, be to get the people like the vanilla and the strawberry. So put out like make that right now. Everybody like a lot of people have their eyes on it. But because it's chocolate, they're not buying it as much. I'm kind of forced to buy it because I want the calcium. But if you have vanilla or another flavor. I'll be all over it. I mean, that that will be that will be my only food. And I used to take eggshells a long time ago, but uh, and and I thought they really helped. You know, g uh, given that I had spent many years not basically intaking zero calcium, like su such a minimal amount. And then at a certain point, I noticed they started upsetting my stomach, and so they only wouldn't upset my stomach if I powdered them in my Vitamix uh, and made them at home. And so, but I think they're a useful transition tool. But I think uh, ideally a person would want to transition to food if possible. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't used it for years. So Matthew Riley again, and he apologized for so many questions and he said he just wanted to support the stream. Thank you so much, Matthew. Sincerely appreciate that. He says, oh, thoughts on gel calcium supplements made for pets. The only one I can find without excipients. So I'm desperate. Uh, goal improving uh, calcium to phosphate ratio pets. I think that... I, I know lots of people that gave uh, the a place for pause was a company that made eggshell calcium. And I know a few people that have given that to their pets with no issues. Yeah. If the label, I mean, you'd be surprised, but the, the, the laws in the, at least in the United States, they're, they're more stringent in terms of purity and lack of excipients for food mm -hmm. for animals than, than they are for humans. Um, and I think if the label basically says there is nothing else except, except this, Except the the eggshell powder in it, it's probably it's probably true. I mean, like unless you have a lab that is willing to test it, um, I would actually trust this more than a, a product for humans that have calcium, because uh, you know there are now all these laws that allow you to import it from any country that claims to comply with the CGMP, the good uh, the common good manufacturing practices. So a lot a lot of vendors selling in the United States imported from China. But I again, they're published case reports on calcium supplements from China causing kidney failure and liver failure. So, so again, if you have if you have you found it for pets and it seems like pure calcium uh, uh, eggshell eggshell powder and that's what it says on the label, I would trust it more and I would test the, the human. Yeah, supplement. and just to clarify, he, Matthew is asking for human consumption, and so I use that a place for paws eggshells for myself but they were just a little ground a little too thick and so i i noticed a little bit of a problem with that so so again it would probably a matter if a person were sensitive had an insensitive intestine the if how, how ground down the eggshells were but yeah what you said is uh great stuff thank you matthew sincerely appreciate that uh ricky rocks for five dollars and then one more after this uh he says is it possible to have high cortisol without having a high heart rate and what is the best way to measure cortisol levels throughout the day? Yeah, of course it is. It's actually cortisol. Cortisol doesn't raise heart rate that much. It's adrenaline that does. Um, and there are some people that, for example, people with cushions they have very high cortisol, but, but their heart rate is not. It's not very. It's not. It's not very elevated. Um, you know, usually, um, if you, I mean, I'm not saying the person has Cushing syndrome. I'm just saying they have elevated cortisol. But if adrenaline isn't rising concurrently with it, then the heart. Um, I know quite a few people that had that basically, like uh, when they when they ate and their cortisol levels uh, dropped, their heart rate increased because it allowed for thyroid to kick in. So sometimes cortisol, if it's too high, can actually lower the heart rate. Um, um, people that are on an exhaustive amount, not it's a bad bad choice of words. People who do a lot of exhaustive exercise and their heart, their resting heart rate is really low, and they they have probably high cortisol baseline cortisol. The 
core heart rate are inversely correlated. And if they do things to lower the cortisol, such as switch to resistance drugs to, that oppose the effects of cortisol, such as anabolic steroids, their heart rate rises. So uh, high, high cortisol is not correlated with heart rate and sometimes can even lower it. It's the adrenaline that, uh, that is associated with the elevated heart rate. Great. Last question from Oren uh, for $5. Thank you so much. He says, in the last couple of videos, you and Pete talked about philosophy and the organism. I majored in math slash philosophy, so I wanted to ask you if you knew of or liked Heidegger. Um, I, I liked Wittgenstein more. That's why I mentioned him to Ray in like the first podcast. Um, you know, you have to be careful with the philosophers. Many of them are, are, are getting entangled in their own language. So if it becomes, if the work becomes excessively logical and separated from reality, no matter how beautiful it is, no matter how complex it is, um, it starts to become highly suspicious. I think that's one of the main reasons Pete and, and I dislike dislike Hegel, even though his idea of ism is actually pretty. It's it's it goes goes all the way to Aristotle. But Aristotle saw this in nature and then developed his philosophy based on things that he observed in nature. While Hegel did it the other way around, was more idealistic, tried to define these idealized processes that came into clash with each other. And then if you read his work, you'll see that at some point it becomes so abstract that it becomes hard to understand. It's not that his wording is really difficult or the language that he uses, it becomes too abstract and you will sense this depletion of energy when you're reading these philosophers and you start getting um, into these entangled arguments um, that have nothing to do with reality. I, to me, For me, that's a sign that a philosopher is, uh, is, is not to be you know, trusted too much on, on his work. I like philosophers that are natural philosophers, you know, they saw something in the world and try to explain it. Not they came up with a nice idea and then try to find confirmation for it in the real world. That's how mathematics works. Great question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. One last one, Rami Adi. I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Uh, he says, have you looked into t uh, Tom O'Neill's book on Manson and the CIA would be interesting to ask Pete. I, I think Joe Rogan and mentioned this on his uh, podcast. Have you heard of it? You mean Charles Manson? Yeah, yeah. Charles Manson and like the cult that basically they killed uh, these people in like in um, in in LA. In yeah, LA? I think he was a product of the MK Ultra stuff, and so it, it, there, there's another author. I'm forgetting his name, but he said that a lot of uh, uh, serial killers have CIA and intelligence um, roots. Yes, yeah. I'll give you a great example. I don't know about Charles Manson, but uh, I was I was uh, I don't I don't want to say obsessed, but I was really interested in the Unabomber and his work because he published the Unabomber manifesto and now it's becoming more and more popular because a lot of people like from the alt right they they've kind of decided that he's their hero. He kind of defined how society is going to collapse because we're relying on technology too much. There's a lot of actually good stuff in in his writings. Anyways, uh, Theodore Kaczynski was actually a sub uh, who participated in MK, MK Ultra, and his professor at at Harvard tortured him for years uh, and subjected him to these experiments for basically like uh, young and impressionable Theodore, who was actually, I think he was at Harvard at the age of 60. He was a very gifted child mathematically. Um, he basically uh, subjected him to, the, to years of psychological torture um, and and most of the torture consisted of inducing learned helplessness. And the idea of this professor was been, how can this be turned into a weapon of the CIA to essentially break people that they take into custody, like foreign spies, you know, to figure out if these people are double agents or if they're being sent to mislead the CIA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a um, you know, serial killer. You know, I, I think he like four or five people threw the bombs. But many of the pe people who were serial killers and then eventually got summarily executed without that much of a, you know, appeal process and trials, um, they usually had some kind of a connection with the, with the, with the clandestine agencies. Um, many, many times um, the people that the agencies pick to do the dirty work are actually, you know, you know, former military and they've participated in many of these experiments. I think um, the guy... Uh, Sirhan Sirhan, who killed the uh, who killed Bob yeah, Bob yeah. Kennedy, I think he is he is an, an operative. Um, Harvey Oswald was a mm -hmm. CIA operative, 
and he was actually spent, I think, several years in the German office of the CIA getting trained to do that kind of work. Um, to, be the, to be the uh, patsy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but, you know, serial killers are connected to the CIA, but I think a significant number of ones that are that are that, are, that were used to do political killings, so, uh, you know, people like the Unabomber that essentially kill, preach to their killings, many of those people were either directed to do the killings by the CIA or lost their mind as a result of these experiments that were run on them. And, in fact, it was a... Um, I think there was an attempt to sue the U.S. government by relatives of Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and they claimed that these years of torture, when he was still a minor, right? Uh, they said this is this is illegal. This should have never happened. And second, number one, number two, it's the U.S. government that's responsible for Theodore losing his mind. So should she, he should have never been tried, declared mentally unfit, and then the U.S. government should be picking up the tab and reimbursing all of the victims and should be releasing documents as to what other things were done to him that, that are now classified. So it's known that he... he um, so one of the experiments that this guy at Harvard did on Theodore was uh, basically on a daily basis, he would, hook in up, he would hook in up to these headphones and then a very experienced lawyer, uh, his experience in prosecuting criminals, would be in the other room and start to criticize and belittle and mock uh, you know, little Theodore until until he is basically reduced to like tears, and over time, uh, I have to send you the diaries. They're really like freaky. Over time, you'll see how initially Theodore would like break down and mm -hmm. cry a little. He would harden up, and eventually, he actually started yelling back at the lawyer to the point that Theodore managed to get the lawyer to lose his nerve. Mm -hmm. And it was at that time that. <laughs> <laughs> it was at that time that the doctor thought that you know you know Theodore was successfully you know turning into a into a weapon into an operative. He was invincible to belittling him. Essentially, he was invincible invincible to psychological warfare. He was ready to be unleashed unleashed upon the world. And then the experiment ended. You know Theodore went out in the in the real world, and uh, you know for all we know, the the mailing of the bombs to the different universities wasn't directly linked to the CIA. But of course, who knows, right? This will never get declassified. But it was, you know, when when he was arrested and and they were they were um, interrogating him. Several of the interrogators who were seasoned cops who who done this for decades said that they, you know, the thing that terrified him about him was that this guy could never be stressed. Like they would sit there and interrogate him for hours, and he will sit there and calmly smoke a cigarette and drink coffee after coffee. And eventually, the interrogators would lose their nerve. And leave the room and want this to be over, and the guy could do it indefinitely, you know, like for as long as people want it. So, you know, I, I think there's definitely a connection between hardened criminals, especially ones used for political purpose, and some kind of a government program that turned them into this. Um, I don't know of that many processes in real life for regular people that can create a psychopath like that. They can certainly turn you into, make you lose your nerve and do something out of rage like bring a gun to work and shoot a few co-workers that have been tormenting you. But that level of sophistication, planning, and sort of for revenge, I think it takes a, you know, years of, 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 of uh, determined um, you know, effort and practice and pressure upon an individual, which typically only a government agency can afford to do. Yeah, Dave McGowan, I, I, didn't get, I couldn't get this book delivered to me in Mexico, but it's called Program to Kill the Politics of Serial Murder. And he talks, he's, this guy, he, yeah. he passed away, unfortunately, but Dave McGowan is such an amazing researcher and he's really funny too. So reading his books is just like a joy. Um, but that book, and then also t who's a better example of kind of like a um, government chaperones uh, terrorist than Timothy McVeigh. Like uh, there are so many extremely yeah. sketchy things about Oklahoma City and the video that hi do you know where his first no. legal team to interrupt you? No, I didn't his know. His first legal team quit and said that that basically they, they refused to defend him because they thought that Timothy is part of a much bigger uh, conspiracy. I kind of do that. There is no way in hell he could have pulled by this by himself, and the judge refused to basically release documents that the prosecution had, right? And the team said, we, we cannot try this guy in secret. We have to see the evidence you have against him. And we know through peripheral means that he, there was a much bigger group that actually gave him orders. We want to know who those people are. You guys know. So 
if, if the government knows that this person was controlled from the outside and refuses to give us the app on that, well, it's it's impossible to defend him. So you might as well just declare him guilty and, and get it over with. And that's pretty much what happened. The, in, in this video, the concept of sheep dipping, which is like you totally exit out of the military or whatever, but you're actually still working for them. Um, but this, this, if anybody hasn't seen it. Okay. If you work for a clandestine agency, first of all, by law, you're sworn into secrecy for life. Mm -hmm. That very thing, because, and I think that actually you have to undergo annual interrogations through a polygraph test for them to find out whether you have really opened your mouth. Long, you know, retired or, or you have left the agency, but there is a requirement which you're bound to for life to show up every year and you undergo an interrogation and they keep asking you and they kind of control your life. Really, you have to let them know if you go to some certain countries. You have to you have to do all of these different things long after you've left. So suffice it to say, once you're in, there's no out. The only different the only difference between you and an active duty personnel like at the actual agency is whether you show up to work every day at this building or not. But as far as you still being part I accidentally switched the outro. Uh, okay, with that, I think we've been on here for three hours, and this has been the most uh, tech problematic uh, live stream ever done. You guys, thank you so much for kind of bearing with us. I, I was super excited to make an awesome stream today, and so unfortunate that it happened, but I still sincerely appreciate talking to Georgie. Uh, follow him on twitter.com slash hate it. Go to idealabsdc.com. Check out his supplements. You can follow me on Instagram. Uh, I do coaching through danny uh, dannywriting.com slash resources you can follow me on instagram um twitter and then telegram uh and also i'm gonna i'm gonna edit and merge these episodes together and so unfortunately we'll lose the chat but i just think we'll have to do that and georgie any parting words uh just hang in there i think tr the truth is slowly coming out Hopefully the world, if the world collapses, you won't, <laughs> we'll be able to rebuild it anew. Just stay and safe. And guys, if I can figure out how to not have this problem again, I'll do a solo stream next week. And then also, if we can figure out not to have this problem again, we'll do the Ray episode the week after with Georgie and I. So guys, thank you so much. Sincerely appreciate it. Have a safe weekend. And thank you, Georgie Dinkoff. Okay. Bye guys. Thank you.